Lesson 12 A Message Worth Sharing Sabbath Afternoon September 12 The Gospel message proclaimed by Christ's disciples was the announcement of His first advent to the world. It bore to men the good tidings of salvation through faith in Him. It pointed forward to His second coming in glory to redeem His people, and it set before men the hope, through faith and obedience, of sharing the inheritance of the saints in light. This message is given to men today, and at this time there is coupled with it the announcement of Christ's second coming as at hand. John in the Revelation foretells the proclamation of the gospel message just before Christ's second coming. He beholds an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and 7. In the prophecy, this warning of the judgment with its connected messages is followed by the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. The proclamation of the judgment is an announcement of Christ's second coming as at hand, and this proclamation is called the everlasting gospel. Thus the preaching of Christ's second coming, the announcement of its nearness, is shown to be an essential part of the gospel message. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 226 and 227. The work of preaching the gospel has not been committed to angels, but has been entrusted to men. Holy angels have been employed in directing this work. They have in charge the great movements for the salvation of men. But the actual proclamation of the gospel is performed by the servants of Christ upon the earth. Said Jesus, Walk while ye have the light lest darkness come upon you. John chapter 12, verse 35. Those who turn away from the light which God has given or who neglect to seek it when it is within their reach are left in darkness. But the Savior declares, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. Whoever is with singleness of purpose seeking to do God's will, earnestly heeding the light already given, will receive greater light. To that soul, some star of heavenly radiance will be sent to guide him into all truth. The Great Controversy, page 312. To the Christian is granted the joy of gathering rays of eternal light from the throne of glory and of reflecting these rays not only on his own path, but on the paths of those with whom he associates. By speaking words of hope and encouragement, of grateful praise and kindly cheer, he may strive to make those around him better, to elevate them, to point them to heaven and glory, and to lead them to seek, above all earthly things, the eternal substance, the immortal inheritance, the riches that are imperishable. Ellen G. White Comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1183. Sunday, September 13. Peter's Present Truth Message Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. No matter how long we may have been traveling in the way of life eternal, we need often to recount the mercies of our Heavenly Father toward us and gather hope and courage from the promises of His Word. Peter realized the value of constant vigilance in the Christian life, and he felt impelled by the Holy Spirit to urge upon the believers the importance of exercising great carefulness in the daily life. Our life work is before us. It is for us to give diligence to make our calling and election sure by giving heed to the plain instruction contained in God's holy word. There is a heaven to win and a hell to shun. But even under adverse circumstances, we may watch unto prayer and set an example in godly conversation that will be a powerful testimony for the right. We cannot afford to speak words that would discourage our fellow pilgrims in the Christian pathway. Christ has given His life in order that we might live with Him in glory. Throughout eternity, 
he will bear in his hands the prints of the cruel nails by which he was transfixed to the cross of Calvary. In Heavenly Places, page 299. Satan is pressing in on every side, and unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. If the chosen messengers of the Lord should wait for every obstacle to be moved out of their way, many never would go to search for the scattered sheep. Satan will present many objections in order to keep them from duty. But they will have to go out by faith, trusting in Him who has called them to His work, and He will open the way before them as far as it will be for their good and His glory. Jesus, the great teacher and pattern, had not where to lay His head. His life was one of toil, sorrow, and suffering. He then gave Himself for us. Those who, in Christ's stead, beseech souls to be reconciled to God and who hope to reign with Christ in glory must expect to be partakers of His sufferings here. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. Early Writings, pages 63 and 64. Monday, September 14. Revelations End Time Focus The disciples of Christ were looking for the immediate coming of the kingdom of His glory, but in giving them this prayer, Jesus taught that the kingdom was not then to be established. They were to pray for its coming as an event yet future. But this petition was also an assurance to them. While they were not to behold the coming of the kingdom in their day, the fact that Jesus bade them pray for it is evidence that in God's own time it will surely come. But the full establishment of the kingdom of His glory will not take place until the second coming of Christ to this world. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is to be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Daniel chapter 7 verse 27 they shall inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. And Christ will take to himself his great power and will reign. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, pages 107 and 108. We must cherish and cultivate the faith of which prophets and apostles have testified, the faith that lays hold on the promises of God and waits for deliverance in His appointed time and way. The sure word of prophecy will meet its final fulfillment in the glorious advent of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. The time of waiting may seem long. The soul may be oppressed by discouraging circumstances. Many in whom confidence has been placed may fall by the way. Let us ever hold in remembrance the cheering message. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Prophets and Kings Page 387. To prepare a people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform was to be accomplished. God saw that many of His professed people were not building for eternity, and in His mercy, He was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. This warning is brought to view in Revelation chapter 14. Here is a threefold message represented as proclaimed by heavenly beings and immediately followed by the coming of the Son of Man to reap the harvest of the earth. The first of these warnings announces the approaching judgment. The prophet beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. 
for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and 7. The Great Controversy, page 311. Tuesday, September 15. Revelation's End Time Message. God's people must take warning and discern the signs of the times. The signs of Christ's coming are too plain to be doubted, and in view of these things, everyone who professes the truth should be a living preacher. God calls upon all, both preachers and people, to awake. All heaven is astir. The scenes of earth's history are fast closing. We are amid the perils of the last days. Greater perils are before us, and yet we are not awake. This lack of activity and earnestness in the cause of God is dreadful. This death stupor is from Satan. He controls the minds of unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and leads them to be jealous of one another, fault-finding, and censorious. It is his special work to divide hearts that the influence, strength, and labor of God's servants may be kept among unconsecrated Sabbath keepers and their precious time be occupied in settling little differences when it should be spent in proclaiming the truth to unbelievers. The time has come when those who choose the Lord for their present and future portion must trust in Him alone. Everyone professing godliness must have an experience of his own. The recording angel is making a faithful record of the words and acts of God's people. Angels are watching the development of character and weighing moral worth. Those who profess to believe the truth should be right themselves and exert all their influence to enlighten and win others to the truth. There is no help for us but in God. In this state of earth's confusion, we can be composed, strong or safe, only in the strength of living faith nor can we be at peace only as we rest in God and wait for His salvation. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, pages 260 and 262. It is not necessary that anyone should yield to the temptations of Satan and thus violate his conscience and grieve the Holy Spirit. Every provision has been made in the Word of God whereby all may have divine help in their endeavors to overcome. If they keep Jesus before them, they will become changed into his image. All who by faith have Christ abiding in them carry a power into their labor which makes them successful. They will be constantly growing more and more efficient in their work, and the blessing of God, shown in the prosperity of the work, will testify that they are indeed laborers together with Christ. But however much one may advance in spiritual life, he will never come to a point where he will not need diligently to search the scriptures, for therein are found the evidences of our faith. All points of doctrine, even though they have been accepted as truth, should be brought to the law and to the testimony. If they cannot stand this test, there is no light in them. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 574 Wednesday September 16. Understanding God's Message More Fully In this letter to the Corinthians, Paul endeavored to show them Christ's power to keep them from evil. He knew that if they would comply with the conditions laid down, they would be strong in the strength of the Mighty One. As a means of helping them to break away from the thraldom of sin and to perfect holiness in the fear of the Lord, Paul urged upon them the claims of him to whom they had dedicated their lives at the time of their conversion. Ye are Christ's, he declared, ye are not your own, ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Acts of the Apostles, page 306. Our bodies are Christ's purchased possession, and we are not at liberty to do with them as we please. All who understand the laws of health should realize their obligation to obey these laws which God has established in their being. Obedience to the laws of health is to be made a matter of personal duty. We ourselves must suffer the results of violated law. 
we must individually answer to God for our habits and practices. Therefore, the question with us is not, what is the world's practice, but how shall I as an individual treat the habitation that God has given me? The Ministry of Healing, page 310. God desires us to reach the standard of perfection made possible for us by the gift of Christ. He calls upon us to make our choice on the right side, to connect with heavenly agencies, to adopt principles that will restore in us the divine image. In His written word and in the great book of nature, He has revealed the principles of life. It is our work to obtain a knowledge of these principles and by obedience to cooperate with Him in restoring health to the body as well as to the soul. Men need to learn that the blessings of obedience in their fullness can be theirs only as they receive the grace of Christ. It is His grace that gives man power to obey the laws of God. It is this that enables him to break the bondage of evil habit. This is the only power that can make him and keep him steadfast in the right path. The Ministry of Healing, pages 114 and 115. God gave to men the memorial of His creative power, that they might discern Him in the works of His hand. The Sabbath bids us behold in His created works the glory of the Creator. And it was because He desired us to do this that Jesus bound up His precious lessons with the beauty of natural things. On the holy rest day, above all other days, we should study the messages that God has written for us in nature. As we come close to the heart of nature, Christ makes His presence real to us and speaks to our hearts of His peace and love. Christ's Object Lessons, page 25 Thursday, September 17 God's Final Appeal Again I say, the Lord hath not spoken by any messenger who calls the church that keeps the commandments of God, Babylon. True, there are tares with the wheat, but Christ said he would send his angels to first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the garner. I know that the Lord loves his church. It is not to be disorganized or broken up into independent atoms. There is not the least consistency in this. There is not the least evidence that such a thing will be. Those who shall heed this false message and try to leaven others will be deceived and prepared to receive advanced delusions, and they will come to naught. There is in some of the members of the church pride, self-sufficiency, stubborn unbelief, and a refusing to yield their ideas, although evidence may be piled upon evidence which makes the message to the Laodicean church applicable. But that will not blot out the church that it will not exist. Let the angels do the work of separation. Selected Messages, Book 2, pages 68 and 69. In the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message and the voice heard in heaven, Come out of her, my people, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Revelation chapter 18, verses 4 and 5. As God called the children of Israel out of Egypt that they might keep his Sabbath, so he calls his people out of Babylon that they may not worship the beast nor his image. The man of sin, who thought to change times and laws, has exalted himself above God by presenting this spurious Sabbath to the world. The Christian world has accepted this child of the papacy and cradled and nourished it, thus defying God by removing his memorial and setting up a rival Sabbath. Selected Messages, Book 3, pages 405 and 406. The fourth commandment, which Rome has endeavored to set aside, is the only precept of the Decalogue that points to God as the creator of the heavens and the earth, and thus distinguishes the true God from all false gods. The Sabbath was instituted to commemorate the work of creation, and thus to direct the minds of men to the true and living God. The fact of his creative power is cited throughout the scriptures as proof that the God of Israel is superior to heathen deities. Had the Sabbath always been kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to his Maker as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, 
or an infidel. The institution which points to God as the creator is a sign of his rightful authority over the beings he has made. The change of the Sabbath is the sign or mark of the authority of the Romish church. Those who, understanding the claims of the fourth commandment, choose to observe the false in place of the true Sabbath are thereby paying homage to that power by which alone it is commanded. The Story of Redemption, pages 382 and 383. For further reading, The Faith I Live By, Established in the Present Truth, page 218, and God's Amazing Grace, Joy Everlasting, page 358.